father to the little son happened to be reading from the book of Genesis and the creation account there in Genesis. Uh, the mother was pretty excited about the story. The little son was also excited and really getting into it. Uh, got to the place where Eve was created from the rib of Adam. And she explained, really got carried away, and explained how painful that must have been. That uh, from the rib of Adam, uh, Adam received his wife Eve. Uh, finally, the little boy went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, the mother heard some commotion. She got up very quickly, went to the son's room, and there was the son, and he was holding his side and in pain, and he said, well, you know, she said, what's wrong? And, 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 and he said, I, I don't know what's wrong. He said, it's, it's my rib. He said, Mom, he said, I think I'm going to have a wife. Okay. <laughs> well... <laughs> That's about how easy it is to develop a false teaching in the church. It starts with a well-meaning scripture and thought, and before you know it, it's a belief. And Paul deals with these false teachings with the Colossian church. In our scripture text this morning, if you take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Colossians, the second chapter, starting with verse 6, Colossians 2, verse 6. Colossians 2, 6 through 23. The very first thing Paul wants us to know is this. The church is one spiritually. I want you to remember that. The church is one spiritually. Listen to what Paul says in verse 5. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted up and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We have something very special here at New Hope Christian Church. This is a church, a rather unusual church in our country, a church where many of our people are separated from this local congregation for a major part of the year. But we are blessed to have those people with us during the winter, and you are an essential part of this ministry and this church, and we're so thankful that you're here during these winter months and in our church we even have a dual membership where you can be a member of a church up north and you can be a member of a church here and you can feel loyalties to both church and you can feel the support from both congregations and though we are separated by many miles listen we are together spiritually and that's exactly what Paul's talking about in this scripture text. And that's what's important in this passage of scripture. We are together spiritually. And when you are separated from New Hope Christian Church for several months, we want to be able to communicate with you. We want to know what's going on in your life spiritually. We want you to know what's going on in our lives spiritually. We want to rejoice in your stories of faith. And when you leave New Hope Christian Church in Nokomis this year, we want to make sure that you find a church in your community and that you worship in that church and that you go strong in your faith in the Lord. And Paul puts it this way, that you be rooted deeply. Know that you are deeply loved and needed by the church we are here for you. Stay in contact with us by email and phone calls and text messages. The body of Christ has a solid front line all around the world. The Apostle Paul uses some army terms here. He talks about the idea of fighting a common enemy. And that common enemy is the devil. And we are involved in that fight as Christians around the world. And as a Christian, Paul says, you were baptized into Christ. And as Christ, 
He is the anointed one. As Jesus, he is your Savior. And as Lord, he is sovereign. And so you are rooted in Christ, built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught. And I love this part, overflowing with thanksgiving. Paul says, dig your roots deep. The idea of roots being dug deep is the idea that those roots are strong enough that they cannot be uprooted. You are being built up. Indicates a continual process. Listen, our growth in Christ never ends. And Paul says when you're growing in Christ, you're going to come to the place where you overflow with thanksgiving. And I love this little phrase in the text that Paul uses. Live your lives. I want you to know something. I plan to live this life to its best, all right? And that's what I want you to do is live your life to the very best. And I am active as a Christian in the body of Christ. And when I am separated from my spiritual family, the church, and when I am separated from my blood family at home, I'm going to do everything in my power to help my church family, my spiritual family, grow in Christ. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help my blood family grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something today. We don't retire as Christians. Instead, we just retool for service, okay? There's another side to this text. And that has to do with eternity. Being separated, absent from the body. This past week, two of my friends have died. One, Philip Orr. Philip was young. He was 67 years old. He was hit in a car wreck by a drunk driver. And he was killed. He was a wonderful man of God. He was an elder in his local church there in Illinois. At one time, he was the librarian at St. Louis Christian College, and most recently, he was a librarian at a state university in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Phil was a great guy. He was single, lived with his mom all of his life. Something interesting about Phil, his dad died in his 90s. Uh, his dad also retired in his 90s. His dad retired one day, died the next day. Phil told me, he said, I don't want to be like my dad. He said, I want to retire early. And I want to have those retirement years to live. Phil retired early, but he died early. Listen, my friends, I think it's very important that we understand that we don't just retire Instead, we retool for service to the Lord. Somebody else died this week, a dear friend, Dr. Eleanor Daniel. I suspect that this morning in churches across this country and literally around the world, the number one illustration that's going to be given today is the illustration of Dr. Eleanor Daniel. She died Friday morning. She was 77 years old. I remember Eleanor Daniel from back in 1973. She was an associate minister at Lincoln Christian Church in Lincoln, Illinois. At that time, literally, there were only a handful of females in ministry. And Eleanor Daniel was one of those females in ministry. I remember the time that I met her in the church there in Lincoln, Illinois. She was sitting at a desk, and I said, where is your office? She said, this is my office. It was simply a desk in a hallway, and she was satisfied with that. She was such a humble kind of person, and she served the Lord continually with dignity. She went on to get her Ph.D. She taught at Cincinnati Christian University, 
in Emmanuel School of Religion. She was the dean of Emmanuel School of Religion for many years. Health turned against her, and she ended up in a nursing home. But Eleanor said, you know, this isn't a time of retirement. Instead, this is a time of retooling. And so from the nursing home, she started a blog, and she began to bless thousands of people's lives around the world every month with her blog. Her last two blogs were written in February of this year. The first one was on the word joy. The second one was on the word peace. She had a logo for her blog. That's the logo. She knew that someday that wheelchair would be empty. She would be separated from the body, but she would be present with the Lord. And you notice there on the wheelchair, the only things left, just the books that she wrote. That's about it. She knew that she wanted to make a difference, and she did make a difference, and that last blog she wrote was on peace. She went back to the nursing home and she said, I found out that I'm going to die in about two weeks. And her friend looked at her and said, Eleanor, your life is filled with so much joy. And there's just a peace on your face. You are at peace with this, aren't you? And she said, I am at complete Peace. She knew that she would be absent from the body, but she wanted to make sure that her influence continued. And that's what God calls us to do. He knows that someday we'll be absent from the body, but all oh, listen, our influence needs to continue on for generation after generation after generation. Now, the next thing Paul says is this the church has some basic principles. We got to remember that. There are some essentials to our faith. And Paul mentions essentials that deal with the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ... All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it on the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Paul says, listen, there are some basics in the faith. There are some essentials in the faith. And when it comes to these essentials in the faith, they are not optional. Instead, they are essentials. The first one is this. Christ is the fullness of deity. That's it. Christ is God. And he resides in you. And Paul says Christ is alive, and that's really what makes you alive. He gives you life. He says it's an essential that you understand and that you believe that. It's not an option. Christ makes a difference in your life. And when you read this passage of Scripture, nearly every word echoes with the importance of Christ who lives in you. And the very deity of God takes residence in your life when you become a Christian 
and it makes a difference. Christ wants to be at home in your heart. The word fullness, an interesting word, indicates that you are filled full with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus makes that kind of difference in your life. And the resources in your life are many because of Jesus. That's the first essential. The second essential, Christ is the head of every power and authority. Remember that one, would you? Christ is the head of every power and authority. And that means that Christ is all sufficient. In Christ, every spiritual need is met. You can always trust in Christ, whatever the situation. Now, I think it's safe to say politically this morning that all of you either supported Barack Obama in his views and philosophies or support Donald Trump in his views and philosophies. I don't think it would be fair to say that you could support both of them, okay, equally and in the same kind of way. Is that safe to say? Yes. I think it's probably safe to say. And Paul says that Christ is the head of all authorities. And that tells me that, you know, it really doesn't matter who leads this country. I still follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is supreme, and he is in charge of all authorities and all powers. Now, be convinced I have believed deeply uh, in certain ways that this country should lean just as you do, but Christ is over all and Christ is in all. And whatever happens in my life or in this country, I trust Jesus. Amen. And Paul says this, and that's an essential of the faith. That's an essential of the faith. And remember Paul was saying that when he was imprisoned for standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ third essential that he gives is this. Christ gives life through baptism. Paul describes your baptism as a spiritual circumcision. It's putting off of the sinful nature. It's a changing of dirty clothes. You take off dirty clothes. You put on new clean clothes. And hopefully you're not like me this morning and put your sweater on inside out, okay? But I did and got to church, but it got changed, all right? Take off those old clothes. You put on new clothes. That's what uh, Paul says about Jesus. And you're baptized into Christ. And it's a spiritual cleansing of sin. It is that circumcision of the heart represented in baptism. It is that outward picture of something that happens on the inside. A changed heart. Jesus changes your life completely. And baptism, Paul says, is a participation in that death, that burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants to make sure that when we leave this section of Scripture that we understand it is Christ who triumphs over all authority. For all authority yields to him through the cross, and your sins are forgiven because of the cross. And then Paul says one third thing in this passage, and that is that the church has false teachers. False teachers. So easy for that false teaching to slip into the life of the church. It's like that story about Adam and Eve, you know, that I gave this morning, and the little boy giving birth to his wife. It's so easy for those false teachings to slip into the life of the church. Look at what he says in verse 16 of the scripture text. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or Sabbath day. They, these are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. 
Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with the idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why live as though you still belong to the world? Do not submit to its rules. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch these rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with us are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such relationships indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack the value in, in, in restraining sexual indulgence. Now, I want you to notice what Paul says here. Paul warns that there are those who will do everything to deceive the Christian. Remember that. Paul makes it clear that there are those who will do everything possible to deceive the Christians. They are false teachers. And it's interesting to me that false teachers very seldom focus on winning the lost. They're interested in winning the church. And they kidnap church members into following their ways. I like what Warren Wiersbe said about this. He said, most of the people I have talked with who are members of anti-Christian cults were at one time associated with a Christian church of a one denomination or another. What happens? They have clever philosophies, clever views that pulled men and women away from the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul says the very first false teaching is legalism. He said it's all about what you eat and about what you drink. It's about festivals. He said you've got to understand it's not about that. Instead, it's about following and worshiping Christ and Christ alone. That's it. It's all about Jesus, and it can't be a legalistic way of life and he goes a step further and he says that legalism is a false humility and he wants us to know that the second false teaching really is that false humility and then he says there's another false teaching and that one involves angels these false teachers believe that angels and the heavenly bodies influence people's lives angels and astrology and things like Ouija boards, all the influence of those things, even today. Now, we're a little bit too old for Ouija boards, I hope. But let me tell you something. I still hear false teachings about angels and about astrology. And these three problems existed in the Colossian church and they still exist in the church today. A false humility regarding our salvation. A legalism. Angels. All of this can cheat or rob a person out of grace freely given to them in salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's some practical application here. And the practical application is so very important. What do we need? We need the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's it. We worship Christ. We follow Jesus. He is our Lord. Here's the deal about false teaching. False teaching changes through the years. It never remains the same. The devil is so clever. 
I remember a time when there was a false teaching. People would say, if you don't speak in tongues, you can't be a Christian. That's just not true. Even today I hear people saying, if you're not healthy, then you're not really a Christian. Listen, you didn't know Eleanor Daniel if you believe that kind of view because she certainly was a faithful Christian. If you're not wealthy, then you can't be a Christian. Listen, I have met all kinds of faithful Christians, some of the most faithful Christians I've ever met in my life in third world countries who have nothing and I couldn't live the way they live and yet they are living as Christians. If you're not prosperous, anything you touch turns to gold. Listen, that's just not reality in the world in which we live. Here's one to think about. I'm not happy. I want to tell you something. Happiness is not necessarily connected with Christianity. Yes, I think some of the happiest people in the world are Christians. But you're going to have times in your Christian walk and your Christian life when you're not a very happy person. And if you think you're less of a Christian because you're not a very happy person, you're not going to be satisfied in your faith. I've heard people say, well, you know, you're not healed. because You just don't believe. And your belief is so strong. There are these various kinds of man-made rules. And Paul says, listen, focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. It's Jesus Christ alone. And he closes with a very simple scripture. He says, you died to this world. Why do you live in it any longer? You are changed. And it's all because of the cross of Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the change that has come in our lives all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. God, you make a difference and we thank you for that difference. Help us more and more every day to focus on Jesus and to be like him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite our praise team to come, if you would, a worship team, and come and lead us in a song this morning. If you've never given your life to Christ, this is the time for you to make that decision to give your life to Christ, to take a stand for him, to say, I want to be baptized into Christ. I want to follow him as my Lord and as my Savior. I want to be a Christian. You come, make that decision today. Don't put it off, okay? You come and make a decision to follow Christ. If you're here today, you don't have a church home, this needs to be your church home. This is a great church. God is really blessing this place and neat things are happening. You need to be a part of the worship and the service in this community as we reach out, make a difference for Him. Come, make a decision for Christ. You could be here today, you need prayer. We want to pray with you, pray for you. We're here for you. You come. Make your decision for Christ as we stand, as we sing.